Welcome everyone to the Museum de Cluny, which is the Middle Ages Museum in Paris. And we're going to explore some ancient Roman ruins here in the middle of Paris. So before Paris was ever called Paris, it was called Lutetia, and it was under Roman rule, taken over by the Gauls, who were the Celtics. This is one of the very few remains of medieval Paris, dating back all the way to the Romans, or actually before medieval times, dating back all the way to the Romans. These were originally baths. So if you're tuning in, I'm Ariel with Urbanus, and we're exploring or wandering through this museum. Uh, we're going to more bump into the history as we look at these artifacts dating back all the way to Celtic and Roman times. So I'm whispering because this museum is very quiet. I want to respect the, the peacefulness of the museum, uh, but we'll continue up and see as much as we can. So all that we're seeing here used to be Roman baths. here is one of the very few remnants of Roman Paris, also known as Lutetia. So we're touching nearly 2,000 years of history, a little bit less than that. This dates back to the second century. Wow. So just imagine the medieval Parisians before it ever became Paris, before it ever developed its own identity. We're taking baths here, and this was also called the Frigerium, which was the place to cool down. Elisa, you're so welcome. Hello, Yona, welcome. Hello, Kay, nice to see you here. Bonjour, Diane. Barrius says, nice history. Yes, the Barrius. Hello, Casey. Hello, everyone. Look at the huge scale of this room. So cool. So we're going to see a little bit of Celtic artifacts, especially with the bull, who is a sign of divinity in the original Gallic culture. Also, Gallic, the Gauls were part of the Celts, um, though the Celts were never a unified people such as the Romans. Almost generally, they all shared very similar languages and very similar beliefs including the head of the bull as a sign of divinity. Yeah, you're right, it's a very quiet museum. Also, we're here just before closing, so let's uh, go upstairs. Bonjour. Carmen. Ancient Roman bath, as I mentioned, these were used as baths, so probably connected to a uh, aquifer. Luckily, there are aquifers all along the city, which made it very easy access to water.
Also, the floors are original. That's the thing. So all these artifacts date back to maximum Roman times. Now most of these are now medieval era. So we can go anywhere from 5th century all the way to the 1300s. So the low lighting is meant to kind of evoke the sense of going back into the deep past. So now we're going to approach one of the most famous works in the Cluny Museum these huge tapestries, similar to what we see in the Louvre, but these depict the unicorns. Oh my god. Wow. So these are tapestries depicting a young woman kind of taming a unicorn. However, what most people don't know is that the unicorn sim symbolizes virginity. This was gifted to her right before her marriage. But the person who made this tapestry knew a little bit something more about this young woman especially how she's lightly stroking the horn of the unicorn and has her in her in her grasp so this woman as depicted here isn't a virgin um, in terms of in the Middle Ages, usually women who were married were expected to be virgins. I know that's, of course, antiquated ideas, but at the time, that's what they, uh, uh, that was their tradition. And this woman, according to at least the tapestry maker, was kind of insinuating that she is quite not a virgin while getting married. Here we have a lion. Hello, Mujafar. Okay, I'm so happy you love unicorns. Arlinda says, wow, I like the low lighting. I really love museums with low lighting. It's by far my favorite also, so I agree. And nice to see somewhere without a big crowd, yeah. I'd do good for her. <laughs> Breathtaking works. So very similar to what we also find in the cloisters in New York City. I'll never look at unicorns the same way. Yeah, yeah, unicorns symbolize virginity. That's why if you deem 
dehorn them. What does that mean? That's why sometimes you'll see a unicorn without its horn, uh, which is not just a horse, but like the, you see that his horn was actually sawed off. Not in this particular series of uh, tapestries, though. She is more kind of lovingly embracing the unicorn. Look at all the beautiful details. Wow. You can even see the unicorn in the mirror. That's so cool. Oh, that is a technique you don't see very rarely before the likes of Da Vinci and Rembrandt. Oh, that's crazy. You're so welcome, Arlinda. Welcome to the Museo de Cluny, the National Museum of the Middle Ages here in Paris. So she's being given a chest. Ooh, what is in this chest? So this is called a dam and then the unicorn, the dame and the unicorn. Made in 1500 and could possibly be a little bit younger. So this is a horn of a narwhal, a sea creature. So these are one of the creatures that people said that unicorns come from. Coincidence that unicorns are really involved in um, European history because if you go way, way, way back, precisely 13,000 years ago, huge rhinoceroses used to roam the European plains. But then the Ice Age began and they all went extinct rather suddenly. Is the unicorn a remnant of those old rhinocer rhinoceroses that people used to see in the Ice Age? I would say most likely yes. Hey Louise, I'm so happy you're loving my videos. Oh, and here is what I was talking about earlier today. The thing to spread incense. Norwals. Yeah, Norwals are in Canada as well. So incense, especially in the Roman Catholic churches, where they mostly use myrrh and frankincense, which were traditionally gifts from the three magi to Jesus when he was a little kid, when he was just born. Wow, so here we have <clears throat> some papers dating back to the 1600s. So you can see the writing of what they did in the 1600s. The beautiful thing is all the wonderful detail of the border, all unique in each of the different pages. Monks were usually in charge of writing these books, so this kind of predates just a few years before the printing press.
So here we have a coffer of a rich family from medieval Paris depicting what I mentioned earlier, uh, the birth of Jesus and the three magi. All right, let's continue on. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. More Madonna and Child, so baby Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Lots of uh, Roman Catholic imagery, Christian imagery overall in the Middle Ages. So Pablo, no sé, yo estoy usando el pasaje de museo aquí y eh, Tú puedes entrar a cualquier, casi todos los museos uh, solamente por 777 uh, euros por seis días. Y un poco menos por cuatro, cuatro días como 40 dólares. I'm using Museum Pass where I'm able to see all the museums for six days uh, only for 77 euro. Uh, so I don't know the individual admission, but it's usually around... 12 to 15 euros so you save a lot of money by getting the museum pass as opposed to other places like in new york city sometimes it's not so worth it Well, it's a small museum. I don't think there's any more. Let's see if we can find a little bit more to see. So here are the foundations outside, or the building from the outside, dating back to Roman times, or shortly after Roman times, second century AD. And cat, you're gonna sneak into my luggage. <laughs> Go for it. It's funny, in order to uh, uh, bring luggage over here, I had to pay 50 euro, which is almost uh, like not not the same price, but um, it's a pretty significant price to br just bring luggage. And Donald, I agree, it's beautiful. Um, I'm not sure if there's more. Let's see if there is. Be downstairs. Also, it's a pretty small museum. I think we've pretty much reached the end 
But here are more of the foundations. Let me show you one more time the frigerium. So if you're just tuning in, we're at the Museo de Cluny, which is the National Museum of Medieval Ages. Pretty small. Um, we saw most, basically everything. Let's see if we can see a little bit more in the frigerium. So here's one more time the refrigerium. And yeah, we saw the entire museum. Wow, we saw it very quickly. Arlinda, I'm so happy you think this is awesome. Yeah, me too. I just love museums like these. The older, the better. So, I think you used to be able to go out into the courtyard, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, the interesting thing is, the reason you see Celtic imagery, as I mentioned, the Celts, or also the Gauls, uh, were originally here before uh, the Romans came. And the reason the Romans end up invading uh, all of France and many other parts of Europe, all the way to uh, the very tip, to the middle of England, uh, at the border of modern-day Scotland, is because Julius Caesar's campaigns, he was really the first one to push against the Celts. So much so that he ended up really committing the genocide against the Celts and killing millions of them. Uh, but it was because of his battles he was able to push in, and that's why we have Roman architecture that still survives, and not really Celt architecture. All right, let's take a look outside. I'll show you from the outside of the museum. Hey, Jenny, oh, thank you so much for the offer. I'm so glad you live so nearby. I will consider that next time I come. I definitely am in love with the city. Okay, let's try to go outside. I did a coat check, so I gotta get my, uh, my bag. So bear with me, we're gonna go outside and I'll show you the more of the Clooney from the outside, which I think is impressive in of itself. Exit is literally through the gift shop. Huh. 
So, as I mentioned, the Museo Nacional del Moje Age, Middle Ages, Museum of the Middle Ages, also known as Museo de Cluny, because this was owned by the Cluny family, not George Cluny, as the American actor, but different Clunys with a U uh, back in the Middle Ages, uh, I think towards the royalty. Mary Tudor lived here after her uncle was killed in England, and Francis I the King of France uh, was keeping a very close eye on her just in case she had a baby here and that baby could challenge the the claim to the throne of England. Sorti is your friend, it really is, it really is. Sorti means exit. Hello Nikki from Oz, I also touch walls fascinating of the age oh I, I love love museums of the middle ages um and even further back one thing i really want to do in upcoming travels i want to go back to france and go to the stones of karnak uh, which are the largest stone megalithic structures in all of europe uh, so it's like stonehenge but times 10 and it's massive uh, however, it's a bit far away from Paris, or a little bit tedious to get there. Uh, but let me show you more of the Museum Cluny around here. So it's a very uh, small museum as we saw, we saw it very quickly. But the cool thing about um, Paris is that you can get yourself a museum pass, I'll show it to you. Fits into your wallet. Here it is, it's a museum pass I got for six days. There's a barcode, barcode in the back. You can use it and you don't need to wait in line to buy tickets. Uh, sometimes you can skip the, even the security line and go through an express line and get into the museum quicker. And in Paris, there's so many different museums that you could just like stroll into them uh, with this museum pass, which is actually really awesome and something I did myself. For example, uh, in Validis, I was close to the Museo de Dodan, decided not to go because it was pretty rainy weather I want to see the gardens when it's sunny uh, but uh, I could have easily just hopped on to the next museum next door and there's uh, two or three other museums around here there's also the Museum of Marie Curie uh, which is the only woman to have won two Nobel Prizes I also mentioned her in a New York City broadcast here are the foundations from the outside look at that highly highly recommend that pass uh, unlike New York City, here there are dozens of museums, more than dozens of museums. Lots and lots of museums, uh, a lot of them small, but uh, really worth it, like the Cluny Museum, just absolutely magical walking inside. Ooh, here we see a little bit more. Oh, that's so cool. So, you don't really see remnants of medieval Paris anymore. This is one of the very, very few examples of that. So yeah, Paris is really interesting. It is, you're right, uh, Louise. The city itself is much quieter in terms of noise level than New York City. It's still vibrant. You still see life almost everywhere. Um, though nowhere as loud and hectic as some places in New York City can be. But also the city where I noticed, and this is a very unique observation, is that it smells good. Um, I did not know a city can smell good until I came here. Um, so another city that smelled good was Helsinki as well, but something coming here is, is directly coming from New York City to here. It's just a really like world of difference in terms of noise and, and smell as well. All right, if um, since that was a short museum visit, let's wander around 
and show you a little bit about a little bit of this arrondissement, which I don't know too much about. So we'll just uh, see if we can bump into history. So there are signs over here that show the major tourist attractions. They're almost all in French, but you can figure it out if you know uh, English language or a Latin uh, Romance language. So there is, of course, a lot of car traffic in certain areas, but you don't feel so, like, all up on them. Well, let's go through this block. This block looks nice. Oh, yeah, let me show you a park. beautiful cast iron work and all the parks have entrances and they don't allow smoking and most of them don't allow dogs so you can just enjoy your peace and quiet here now another thing that a lot of people don't know about the parks is that they usually have toilets or bathrooms here in France similar to England it's always called toilets but they have public toilets it's one of the very rare places you can find a public toilet ironically because uh that's the case that's not the case in most other cities. Now there are parks everywhere. And I highly recommend kind of coming along and staying and sitting in one of the parks. So I don't think there's too much here to see. So let's turn around and I'll show you more of the city. Every turn brings a historic building. It looks like that. So all the buildings that were, were surrounded by, aside from the Museo de Cluny, it are buildings dating back to the 1850s through, 1850s through the 1870s. So they look historic. And it's because of this unique design that George Eugène Haussmann, the master city planner of Paris during that era under Napoleon III, decided to incorporate. However, at the time, it was fairly modern, but still had all these Baroque touches to it. Th that's why it looks historic, but as you see a lot of my New York City broadcasts, buildings also in New York City date back to around that same era. Very rare you see a building before 1835, but you do see buildings... Uh, from uh, 1835 and beyond. But it doesn't look historic because uh, we have that Beaux Arts architecture, it was very monumental. But in New York City, we tend to also always replace buildings. But here, not so much. Here, there are very strict controls on modern buildings. <laughs> Speaking of which, this is the first and only Chipotle I've seen abroad. <laughs> oh, that's funny. This is a Chipotle in Paris. So even Hitler, yes, even Hitler uh, did not want to bomb Paris. At first, at first, um, he did send an order as things were going very downhill for him. He sent an order to his general who was based here to destroy Paris, to burn it down to the ground. Because if Hitler was going to lose, everyone was going to lose the city that was most treasured in Europe at that time, Paris as well. However, the general... And many of the people under his command were Francophiles. At that time, as I mentioned, there was a lot of German tourists. So uh, if you recall, I think it was the broadcast two, two, two days ago, lots of German tourists flooding here as the war was only beginning. So things weren't getting too heated up yet. These German tourists were mostly from the middle class and the lower class, but also the military. And they also were tourists. They came here, they were stationed here, but while they were stationed, they would go to the cafes, they would see all the landmarks, they would take tours. And a lot of them deeply fell in love with Paris, including the general that Hitler called up right before Hitler lost the war. And the general, he had to follow orders. Of course, 
he was uh, it was direct orders. However, somehow the general never picked up the phone after Hitler gave the initial orders. The other people under his command never got the orders. Somehow got lost. Nothing happened. It's because the general loved the city so much he didn't want to destroy it. So he decided to not follow Hitler's orders. And even if he decided to follow Hitler's orders, a lot of the people under his command probably wouldn't have not done the same. So that's why we still have Paris. And unfortunately we don't have uh, many old towns, say in Warsaw or, or uh, Kiev or, or Berlin, many other places. So let's go down this uh, gorgeous little quaint street. Here we have the brasseries. Cars passing through. So this is a working street. Sometimes it's, it's not so obvious if something is a street or not. Hey Wayne, you're watching from Australia. Welcome. Lots of Aussie viewers. I think because of the time difference it makes it easier for you guys to tune in. But that's, that's, I think, the beauty, the majesty of Paris. Um, it does look historic, and I think it's because of this uniform style. Now, Paris also regulates the height of the lights. So why is Paris called the City of Lights? Well, for that, we have to go back again to the time of George Eugen Hausmann. George Eugen Hausmann is basically the Robert Moses of Paris. He was influential in every single aspect of life of Paris. One of those such aspects was building a gas light system. And he added all these gas light systems to, throughout the city of Paris. And there was the entire city was beautifully lit up. He also regulated all the heights of the lamps so the lamps still follow the same exact regulation to this day two different regulations one for pedestrian lighting and the second for um for the the traffic lighting uh, and that's why it was the city of lights and paris also when electricity came out uh and towards the 1880s around there was starting to begin paris was one of the first cities to adopt it after new york but unlike new york Paris already had a system in place that was uniform and that's why Paris kind of got the one up on New York for becoming the city of lights even though New York is where like electricity was invented and took off <laughs> hello Atla from Long Island, welcome. Oh, we see a Canadian flag. This appears to be a little Canadian bar down there. If you want me to show any details, feel free to let me know. We're just wandering around. We started at the Museum de Cluny. Now we're just kind of just going through these streets, seeing what we uh, pop on by. Here's some escargot, some snails. Ooh, beautiful little restaurant, wow. That's gorgeous. Look at that. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous restaurant. This is a, a raclette, so southern France, I think. Creperie. Uh, of course, our pizza. So, yep, cobblestones here. Unlike uh, New York City or London, these cobblestones are much larger. So much, much bigger. There's a foot comparison. So almost the size of my foot. My foot is exactly 12 inches long. I mean, not 12 inches long. Um, yeah, 12 inches. I'm a size 12. Gorgeous, gorgeous.
So this is, this is definitely one of the most picturesque streets. I, I remember coming here for when I first visited Paris. Just gorgeous array of treats, of places to eat. Let's check this out. It's a candy shop. All these gorgeous candies. And here is a pastry shop, uh, pastoria, uh, patisserie, Tunisian patisserie. Lots of Tunisians have moved here to Paris. Uh, Tunisia used to be a formal French colony. And in Tunisia, also like in Paris, I don't think it's related to it being a colony uh, because it predates French colonialism, there's a very strong tradition of making bread all in many of these areas of North Africa, from Morocco to parts of Algeria to Tunisia. And all these, a lot of these Tunisian immigrants are becoming some of the top pastry and bread makers in the city. Uh, I think the one who won the award for the best baguette last year is a Tunisian. So if you stop on by and see some Tunisian vendors, it might be a good, uh, a good uh, thing to buy the bread from them. Nick, uh, I'll be doing Père Lachaise, definitely. I haven't looked into uh, Monte uh, Parnasse, Monte Parnasse uh, yet, but I'll check that out. That's so awesome. Look at this, <laughs> the pirates' candies. So, of course, the British had their pirates, the Spanish had their pirates, the Puerto Ricans had their pirates, like, uh, I'm related to a um, Puerto, very famous Puerto Rican pirate, but also the French had their pirates. That's funny. So, of course, this is a very, very touristy area, and here, ooh... Oh, this is so cool. So here is one of the few streets where you kind of get the sense, the scale of medieval Paris. Uh, this is not quite medieval Paris, but in medieval Paris, before George Eugene Houseman tore down all the streets, he wanted to widen them. And he wanted to widen them because Napoleon III wanted to qu uh, squash any type of revolution that might be starting, fermenting in these tiny little cramped neighborhoods. And what's Wide Streets good for? For allowing the army to march right through. So, Napoleon III wanted to avoid this. Despite its charm, it wasn't good for keeping the, the populace at bay. So this is the seventh arrondissement. Uh, hey, this is the seventh arrondissement. Uh, I'll see what the street name is, but look at this! Wow. Amazing, amazing, tiny little street. Oh, I love, I love the different types of restaurants. I. I'm definitely going to try some couscous at some point. Uh, couscous, very popular like French North African tri um, dish. And since I probably won't be going to um, Algeria anytime soon, though maybe someday, uh, well, I'm gonna try some couscous here at some point. Hello, Jenny, welcome, nice to see you here. Okay, here we have our shawarma. Oh wow, this place is really lit up. So here we, this is uh, Rue de Ochoet, but we were at uh, Rue Xavier Priva. So happy you're tuning in, Tony Tourist. Welcome here. <laughs> so happy you're tuning in, Tony Tourist. I love couscous as well, yeah. I think uh, any uh, outside of North Africa, the best place to find couscous will probably be here in Paris. Uh, but I'll let all of you know when I find some good couscous. Mm. 
La Achouette, there's a famous near, uh, nearby theater. Oh, cool, okay. Here? What's this one? This is so tiny, I love it. Oh my god. Is this a um, theater where they do performances or is it a cinema? It's probably a theater where they do performances. They're playing a, a musical called Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> Very American. Lots of falafel here. So we're close to kind of a major Arab, Middle Eastern neighborhood. So here we have another New York reference, Mulberry Street. If you know the very first pizzeria, I mentioned it many times in my uh, Nolita Social Italy broadcast was Lombardi's, which is located on Mulberry Street. That's funny. So, pizza and beer right over here. And yes, there's creperies. Let me show you some creperies in action. Let's try to find them. We have some Italian gelatos, but there's also a lot of ice cream, French ice cream shops. So here's the creperies. Creperies is like kind of like a fast food in Paris. So think of creperies like hot dogs. Sometimes they're a little bit better than hot dogs, I think. But yeah, it's like almost like the hot dog of Paris. And of course, no city in the entire world, doesn't have to be European, is never without a good old Irish pub. <laughs> is it hard to find cheaper restaurants? Yes, it is. If you want like really hearty food for very cheap, it's, it's difficult. So far, my experience here in three days. Though to caveat that, I do consider myself pretty savvy in finding food because I've done so many videos about food and I've explored so many different cities. Um, but I've had in the past three days a difficult time to find kind of really hearty food. What do I consider hearty? I consider hearty being Something with a lot of meat and some vegetables. It doesn't necessarily have to have meat, but I want some veggies or some, at least some meat. Uh, why I don't consider hearty is usually things that are mostly bready uh, and or have cheese on them. Because if you just eat bread and cheese, it might be extremely tasty, especially if you're in Paris. Uh, but I wouldn't consider it hearty. It's not something that you would kind of get a lot of energy from. So that's why, why I use the word hearty. And yeah, it's a little bit difficult to find like hearty food here for cheap but here there's a lot of uh, falafel places otherwise you will have to go to the bristos or pastries uh, which are actually pretty good price cheaper than the average New York City restaurant but more expensive than casual food in New York City or in London um, so you're kind of in the between so you have to budget a little bit more for food here and you have to have a little bit more patience in wanting to sit down and kind of go to places that you might risk not being so good uh, because there's not that many resources to find the best places because there's not really a tradition of uh, chefs needing to really stick out aside from the top, top high-end restaurants. Unlike in New York City where there's more um, competition in, in the low-end and medium-end restaurants. So yeah, that's, that's, that's food. It's different here. Um, so you have to kind of just adjust yourself to it. But there is definitely good food around here. It's just a little bit harder to find. And once I find them, I'll, I'll tell you more about the history of braceries and bistros. Stay, stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for that. So the reason this is so touristy is because we're right by Notre Dame. Right by Notre Dame. I'll show you a little peek. However, I'll be coming back here and giving you a full history on it. Uh, 
and we'll go back to the city streets. And yeah, there's savory and sweet crepes here in uh, in Paris. Savories usually have cheese and and, and uh, ham. Again, I wouldn't really consider that hearty. It's a great like fast food. But there's now Notre Dame. I'm coming back here, talking more about it soon. Stay tuned. Let's go back into the city streets and show you a little bit more. Let's see, a little bit more down this way. Well, go this direction. I'm gonna show you some of the book vendors. How could you say nope? Me is me. <laughs> Personally, when when I I want something that is uh, very filling for dinner, I usually want like a uh, whole meat, not not cured meats. <laughs> but that's a personal taste, I guess. I do like my fresh food, uh, which won't won't be so easy to find here in Paris. Unless if you go to the markets and the shops, which I'll show you soon. Ooh, let's walk through this park over here. Oh, well, interesting. Here it is. There we go. We have inadvertently bumped into it. I do have to come back here. But Shakespeare and Company expanded to open up a beautiful new cafe. Similar to what they did in New York City as well, actually. And here, we have the iconic bookstore, countless writers, artists, even film directors came and even stayed here, including the likes of Allen Ginsberg, one of my favorite poets personally. Uh, Darren Aronofsky, also one of my favorite movie directors who directed Requiem for a Dream, and Noah and Black Swan have all stayed here at some point. And many, 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 many others. Uh, if you know of any others, let me know in the comments. A famous, famous bookstore. There's a line to get in, which is interesting. So I might do an extra recorded video inside at some point. Well, there we go. Shakespeare and Company, a very popular bookstore. Oh, they don't allow uh, photos inside. Can I go to a library? Yes, I'm going to try and find a library, a library to show all of you. Um, I got to find which one is super pretty. So before, I did a wandering through Le Marais, and we bumped into one of these fountains. And luckily, someone told me what they were called, and I found out a little bit more information. There was a very rich, very rich Francophile... English noble who lived here in Paris uh, right after the French Revolution. His name was Sir Wallace. And Sir Wallace, Lord Wallace actually, Lord Wallace, um, saw that a lot of the Parisians were thirsty. They were thirsty because due to the revolution, a lot of the infrastructure for water uh, was destroyed and they had no access to good, clean water. So Sir Wallace, in order to hope the Parisians built a lot of these fountains all around the city, including this one right here. So this is one of the original ones back to the 1840s. How can you tell they are original? If they are in the dark green color, which Lord Wallace specifically said that he wanted them to be. There's a few new ones built that are in different colors. Let me show you both. Let me show you both. There used to be a little tin cup attached to them. people staying in the upper floors interesting so there used to be a little tin cup attached to them where you could uh, uh, drink it on your own and Gerald welcome hello Lizek so 
there we go. Beautiful. Shakespeare and Company, very kind of like London style uh, coffee shop. Because Shakespeare and Company, as contrary to belief, didn't start here. Started over back there in England. And also they have shops in, in New York City as well. And Helga, I always use uh, for my live videos. Generally, I use my iPhone 7S Plus. I haven't done an HD live video uh, since winter. Uh, so yeah, I use my iPhone 7S Plus. And maybe I'm most likely gonna do a 360 live video at some point, somewhere. I gotta find some cool thing that's awesome to see in every single angle. Uh, so if anyone has any recommendations of what you would like to see in 360 live video, let me know. Ooh, check out this church. This church. Dora, yes, you can clean, you can drink the water, and it's definitely very high enough that no one's giving their dogs the water, like New York City uh, fountains. But here, yeah, I've seen people drink from them. Oh, beautiful buildings, look at that. Hello, Liz from Tijuana. Nice to see you here. So this church is absolutely gorgeous. Eric, I'm so happy you love this place. Me too. Alright, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I'll be back here for Notre Dame and Shakespeare Company, a little bit more on Shakespeare and Company and the other secrets of this nearby neighborhood. If you want to see more videos, tune in every single day at 3 p.m. Paris time, 9 a.m. New York City time for the history tours. And I'll be doing wanderings at other times, so check it out. And, you, and Nick, you say such a tranquil place for a city with a troubled past. Yes, um, it's really tranquil, but vibrant. There's, there's a good energy to the city. Uh, unlike other cities that have troubled past and tend to be kind of like more depressed vibe to it. So I love Paris, such a beautiful city. You'll be seeing more of it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, stay tuned tomorrow at 9 a.m. New York City time, 3 p.m. Paris time for some awesome stuff. And then the next one that I definitely have in mind is Tuesday for Versailles. So if you want to see Versailles, stay, turn, stay tuned on Tuesday. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Au revoir. Au revoir. That means, see you tomorrow.